Jennifer on any documentation, so one in the same. You can call me Hey You, doesn't hey, matter. Yeah, you can call me Mommy, I'll probably answer to that too. So a couple of pieces of old business that we actually need to take care of that we um, didn't, didn't get addressed or we, or we forgot or just found out late about. Um, first is financial report for 2016-2017. So every June, we're supposed to make sure you have a financial report for the full, fisc full fiscal year. Excuse me. 
Um, and so just, just for your information, uh, as UWS members, our records are open to the membership. You are all, you know, owners of this organization, so to speak. So at any time, if you want to see more detailed information on the financials, you're welcome to contact Cindy Hepworth, who's our bookkeeper. Um, just for your information, our net income from 2016-2017 was $4,133.31. That came from a total income of almost $62,000 and total expenses of almost 58000 So, yeah, it's not cheap to run the organization. <laughs> but um, we did come out in the black, and that is always good because black means we will continue to exist. <laughs> so, we like that. Details. Details, I know. I want to keep going. Um, also, we had one more signature award that we um, needed to award from 2016-2017. And we're just, uh, we were behind getting the information on this. So um, that is to Sandy Sleeper. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy is also our mini workshops, one of our two mini workshops coordinators. So she does a lot of work behind the scenes, too. And a bunch of other things. Okay. We have a couple of um, People's Choice Awards that didn't get, uh, well, didn't get announced yet. Is Lola Karchner here? Lola? No? And how about Deb Maycock? Haven't seen her. Deb? Anyone? Okay. Well, Lola and Deb were both recipients of the People's Choice Awards. Lola for the fall 2016 and Deb for the Spring 2017 exhibition. So congratulations to both of them. Okay, a quick Small Works recap. Small Works show happened at Michael Berry Gallery this past summer. This is a great uh, show to enter if you haven't done it or if you're new to the, uh, to the society. It's a, it's a great way to get your feet wet. Um, the best of show was went to Roland Lee for Chessman, Colin, I don't know if it's Chessman or Chessman, Columbines, Chessman, Chessman Columbines, uh, the picture is here on the screen, and also award of excellence to Ian Ramsey for Dusk at Dotenbury, Osaka, and I probably just murdered that name. And there were several other awards, those are all listed here. You can also see these on the homepage of our website. Um, just FYI, if you haven't seen it already, if you haven't visited utahwatercolor.org recently, go check it out. We have a new look. So the old look is on the left, the new look is on the right with our new logo and our refresh in our uh, background, which is actual watercolor background that was painted. So um, it looks kind of cool. Check it out. Okay. Um, Fall 2017 UWS member exhibition reminders. Everybody should have received your acceptance or non-acceptance, like me, from this exhibition yesterday. Um, so don't don't just don't be discouraged if you don't get in. Just keep trying. Um, Mary is is Mary handy? Do you want to come up and give us some details on, for those who are accepted, there are some special instructions on the framings that you need to know about. So Mary, who has been coordinating the exhibition, is going to come give that info to you. Okay, I sent out an email, I sent out several emails yesterday. Um, one was letting the people who entered know that they're jury notifications had been sent by email. And there have been some that have been very, very slow to get to the recipient. So if you have not received notification from Art Call, it won't come from UWS, it'll come from Art Call, then contact me. Um, also, uh, the 25th of September is the drop-off day at, at Bethel Davis Art Center from 10 to 4, uh, 4 in the afternoon. And the hanging is a requirement from BDAC that you use D hooks. And I sent an email to those who were accepted into the show with 
an explanation and a picture of what a D-hook was and how to use it. Their hanging system, they have wires that come from the ceiling and they hook right into the D-rings. And so your painting hangs from that. It does not hang from your wire. So it has to be set up that they can use the D-hooks. If you're not understanding or not sure, just talk to me and I'll help you with that. But that was one thing that she was very concerned about because their hanging system is a little different. Do you have questions? Can the wire still be on there even if the, the, the wire should be on there, should be re ready to hang, but they should they will be hanging from the D hooks. Okay. <coughs> is there a certain number of space? It shows you on that attachment that I sent, it sh it's three to four inches or so on. It'll show you exactly what to do. Okay, anyone else? Just email me if you have a question or are un unsure about something. I'll be glad to help. All right, thanks. Um, one other uh, award that didn't get handed out yet is Therese Beasley here. None of our work people are here. Okay, well, Therese won a Merchant Award at the Small Works Exhibition. She hasn't picked up yet, so we'll keep track in her name. Okay, we have a great year of mini workshops and full workshops and exhibitions and paint outs and all kinds of great activities for you guys this year. So I hope you're all excited and ready to participate. Coming up right away, is Colleen Reynolds' mini workshop, Painting Pets with Personality, which um, I'm actually excited to take because I have a couple of paintings that I want to do for gifts. So there are only a few spots left in this. If you are interested in taking the workshop, we can sign you up tonight. We have a couple laptops here. Um, Sandy Sleeper can uh, answer your questions. Remember Sandy from Signature? Wave big. Um, and you can, or you can just go to our website and click to register from there. So a lot of options for you. Then in October we have Keiko Tanabe coming. She is our national slash international um, exhibition juror for our fall exhibition, as well as teaching our week-long fall workshop. As of today, there are only two spots left in this workshop, and it will be really good. She's got beautiful, beautiful work. She's, uh, her theme of her workshop is capturing light and atmosphere in watercolor. And uh, you can look up her website and see examples of her work. You can register for that tonight if you want. We again have laptops around. You can also do it off your phone or your tablet. Or you can go to the website. Julie Ickes, where's Julie? Julie Ickes, she's our vice president this year. She's in charge of the two full week workshops with the National Instructors. So if you have any questions, you can talk to Julie. A Western Fed. Um, Colleen Reynolds is our Western Fed delegate. She is the past past president. That makes her the WFWS delegate. And we can come up with a lot more acronyms. So um, she is our delegate, but she's not here tonight. So this is just a little reminder of information uh, Colleen has set up a weekly email to remind you to enter Western Fed. It'll come out on Wednesdays. So it, if you have lost your last email and you wanted to click to register, you can do that. You can also go to the website homepage. There's a link to register there. All of the entries need to be in by December 1st. There is no size restriction on the size of your painting. It can be as small as you want. But there are size restrictions, as there were last year, about the outside frame dimensions. So read the prospectus carefully. Let Colleen know if you have questions, and she will answer those for you. The juror for that is Ted Nuttall. I hope I said his name right. <clears throat> Illustrated journaling. Beth Ann has some information for you on that. Thanks, Jenny. Um, last year we had an illustrated journaling group that met for um, half an hour before the regular meetings. We will continue to do that this year, but a lot of people really um, didn't know what was going on, and I thought I'd just go over what this is about. Um, it's a group that's open to all who attend UWS meetings, and it is without cost. 
a class for all levels of experience. The class begins at 6.30 on the evening of the monthly UWS meeting. All are welcome who arrive before 6.30, but not after 6.30. The class will close so we can have some uh, concentration time. Uh, we want to focus and work together respectfully, and the idea is to practice your sketching and drawing techniques for journal, um, keeping journals. Um, bring a drawing, drawing pen and paper, a sketchbook which you're not afraid to mess up, um, and be willing to learn new things, leave your comfort zone, have fun, and make new friends. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. No, she's much taller than you. Thank you. All right, so I won't be doing that if you have to be on time. Sorry. Um, yeah. But it's actually, actually, it seems like a really uh, great idea and a fun group. And so please give it a try if you're looking for a way to just start out again and get your feet wet. That's another good way to do it. All right. September paint out. So Blaine Harrison and Nina Plant Henniger are in. I know they're in the house tonight. Where are you? Lou. So Blaine, see the mustache back there? You can call him Stash. And then Nina in the purple. But, uh, Blaine and Nina are in charge of our paint outs this year. We have the whole schedule laid out for you for the whole year. Every month. There is a plein air painting out opportunity, or in the winter sometimes it's painting in. Um, I suck at plein air, I'll tell you. But I've been doing the paint outs once in a while, and it is great fun. It's a great way to get to know a few people from the Watercolor Society. Afterwards, you get to go to lunch together, and you can all just have good food, even if you don't have good paint. But um, I always feel like the worst day of painting is much better than my best day at the office. So. You know, whatever. So the ne upcoming paint out is at Sugar House Park on Saturday, September 16th at 10 a.m. There is not a particular meeting location. You can go paint wherever you want. But at 1 o'clock, you will be meeting for lunch in Sugar House at the Mellow Mushroom, which is on 21st South, up the street from Local Colors Gallery, if you know where that is. So... If you have questions on that, get in touch with Blaine or Nina. Um, they're in your directory. Their emails are on the slide here. Their email is on the home page of the website. There's lots of ways to get in touch. Or you can go talk to them tonight. Okay, let's pause. Does everybody have a ticket? Everybody have a red ticket? No? No? Who doesn't have one? Julie has the ticket basket. We've got swag. So or swag, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we're going to give away a couple of UWS t-shirts. Because I don't have a t-shirt cannon, but we do have a basket with tickets. <laughs> we got a good crowd tonight. I'm glad so many people are out. Okay, you ready, Julie? Any, anybody else who didn't get a ticket? She did. Barbara. Barbara. Barbara, you did because I gave you one. When you came she lost it. it. She <laughs> lost it. Okay. Yeah, yeah you got the lost. What? I have the lost. Oh, Mary's got the lost. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, you gotta have your ticket if you want to win. Okay. So draw me a note. Well, who else? One more. Okay, so Julie, you want to draw a number? Everybody, everybody got one? Let's have art, one of our token mails. <laughs> okay. We like the token mails. Is it really? <laughs> we have more mails than you, though. I have. I said one of our token mails. <laughs> 875 are the last three digits. 875. 875. Oh, back in the back. All right. Oh, Pesico. All right. 
So you can choose. Do you want a white? Do you want a white or a black? What size are they? White is a large. White is a large. Black is an extra large. Okay, the white one. Okay, and then let's do one more number. Have somebody else pull it out. Who's the gentleman? <laughs> It looks like 871. 871. Oh, Blaine. Oh, All one. right. You get the black extra large. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you probably want to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, the guy. It's a black extra large. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. All right. A few more slides of business, and then we're going to get down to the fun stuff. Um, just so you know, we have. <clears throat> As a UWS member, you have the ability to announce your art-related news, you know, your, pat yourself on the back a little bit, promote your activities, if you've got a show coming up, if you won an award, not in a UWS show, but somewhere else, because the UWS ones we already announced. But, you know, if you won an award, you've got an exhibition coming up, you know, a studio tour, anything like that, let us know about it. We're sending out a monthly e-blast called the FYI. This e-blast will include member news, will include reminders about UWS events, and it will include other possible opportunities around the state that you might be interested in from non-UWS. We try to consolidate that all into one email because we get a ton of emails from us. So that, if you want to be included in that, Send your info to Phil Harrison by the 25th of each month for the following month. So you want it to go in October, send him your stuff by September 25th. And then we have our bi-monthly newsletter, which hopefully everybody's reading and getting. Um, if you're not getting it, let us know, and we'll figure out why. And uh, Mary Pusey is our newsletter person because she wasn't busy enough with the fall exhibition. So... <laughs> Mary does that bi-monthly. If you want to get some information into the November-December newsletter, get that to her as soon as possible, but for sure before the 16th of October. Okay. Now, can you tell me, have you ever served on the UWS board? Raise your hand. Okay. Have you not ever served on the UWS board? Raise your hand. <laughs> We need you. <laughs> so, we are <laughs> we are currently in need of a publicity chair, somebody to send uh, out some email uh, press releases. I have a template ready to go. And also, if not that, but you like to take pictures, you don't have to be professional. It can even be on your iPhone. Uh, we need somebody to just be a little historian for us. Come to the member meetings, take some pictures. Maybe a couple little videos of the meetings just to document our activities for the year. Meetings, exhibitions, whatever you can get to. So if you're interested in that, come let me know. I'd love your help. Many hands make light work. And we do have a very big board, and we love more willing volunteers. And these are two ways to get involved that don't take a ton of time. So, Kent, where is Kent? Kent Baker is our UWS Cash Valley chapter president, and he's going to come up and give you a few Cash Valley announcements. <clears throat> Hello. Um, next week, a week from today, we're going to have our monthly meeting. Um, and at that meeting, we will be having a potluck, a little bit like yours. Um, people are going to bring a painting to show or they're going to demonstrate a painting technique that they really enjoyed or thinks everyone else would share or be interested in, in seeing. Um, we also are going to have a workshop on the 16th with the Lester Lee. Right now we're not sure of the location. Um, I think we have two options here. One is the library. The second one is an art space or an artist studio by Michael. Bingham. And so if you look at the announcements, we'll probably clarify that. Also, yes. yes. Skyview High School. Skyview High School. Oh, it's Skyview High School? Yeah. Okay. We have another workshop there. In, in. 
<clears throat> at Skyview High, High School for the workshop. October 11th, we're going to have um, our, our meeting with a demonstration by Ernie Burdine. And we are tentatively scheduling a workshop on Photoshop, but we're still setting that one up. In November, we are going to be having um, a demonstration by Michael Bingham at his studio. That's the main show. We also are going to be having the winter show, which will start on December 9th. Um, we will be accepting paintings earlier in December. It will go through Christmas, and they'll be at the Thatcher uh, Mansion in, in Logan. So, what? Prospectus will be out soon. Oh, yes. Pro the prospective will be out soon. So um, keep your eyes open for that. All right, I'm going to go forward with some other announcements, but will you draw me two more tickets while I'm doing that? Um, uh, <clears throat> one other thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about our upcoming Western Fed show, and we will also have a uh, UWS Spring Exhibition Prospectus coming out pretty soon. Um, Cache Valley has an exhibition coming out for winter soon. If you want some help photographing your paintings, whether they're for these exhibitions or other things, you can bring them to the November meeting. Mara Naughton, wave to us Mara, also a past president, will be here with her husband, I think, downstairs, and she will help you take good photographs of your paintings for exhibition entries or whatever else you need. Um, the service is free-ish, but we're requesting <laughs> A, a donation, minimum of $5 donation to the Mary Strait Scholarship Fund. That fund is something that, so every year we award a scholarship, uh, two scholarships, one to two high school students in the state, one from Cache Valley, one from other areas of the state that have entered the Spring Bill Art Show. And so I'll, I'll, we'll be doing a few fundraising things throughout the year to help uh, raise money for that scholarship fund so that we can fund those scholarships. So it's great, a worthy cause. We want to make sure that we're encouraging high school students to continue to pursue art. So any other? Just a question on that. Do we show, that's November meeting? The November meeting. And is it before the meeting? Uh, it'll be before and during and after. Okay but not, not past 9 o'clock. So uh, you can show up. We're here by 5.30 for a board meeting. Board meetings are open. If you want to come, you're welcome to. Uh, you might be bored, but, <laughs> but you're welcome to come. So the building will be open at, by 5 or 5. I don't know what time Mara is coming. What time? I'll come about 5.36 to set up. Okay, so between 5.30 and 6 would be the earliest you can get here. and. She'll be doing it all through the meeting. So, uh, any other questions? Okay, are there any announcements or business that I forgot? Because if it's not written down, I forget sometimes. Okay, all right, um, so let's go on to talk about what's coming up. Uh, finally, we want to thank the Zoo Arts and Parks. The Watercolor Society is founded in part by grant money from the ZAP. Foundation, the Zoo Arts and Parks program. So all of you people who are residents of Salt Lake City, thank you for your contribution to, to the ZAP funds. Um, that does help keep our organization going and keep us in the black, which is always good. Um, upcoming tonight, we'll talk about in just a minute, but that is Lester Lee on Tom Howard. And in October, of course, um, will be Keiko Tanabe. So definitely you want to be here in October and you want to come early and get a seat because there are always a lot of people when we have our national instructors presenting. She will be demonstrating. So, All right, tonight I am super excited. There are two, how about we have two men presenting tonight? How is that? <laughs> All right, so we're going to start the night out tonight with uh, Lester Lee who will be giving us a feedback and critique session on paintings and let me tell you it will be the nicest ever critique you will ever ever receive <laughs> so not for me <laughs> ever ever 
I have known Lester literally for 30 years. Um, he was Mr. Lee when we met, but he's <laughs> he's Lester to us He's all. Lester now. <laughs> I was, I was 14, so, you know. Um, anyway, I just, I just can't say enough about Lester. He's a wonderful human being. He's a fabulous artist, and he has the, the best way of encouraging you through something that's like a really constructive criti criticism, if you even could call it a criticism. There's always something good to be said, and he will find it. And it'll, it'll encourage you to move forward, and it'll help you work through your problems. And he's just, I can't say enough about him. I love Lester, and I'm really glad he came. And Tom Howard, in the back there, another past president. We get a theme here. Um, so Tom is going to talk to us about different kinds of plein air setups and um, supplies. And I don't, he's got all kinds of really goodies here. So he's going to talk to us about that stuff. And um, Tom also has some paintings in the back. They are for sale. You can talk to him and work that out with him. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's what we have tonight. I'm really excited. And we're going to start with Lester. Oh, oh, sorry. Two more tickets. Do you have them for me? Okay, Lester gets to choose one. Okay, I'll choose my own. <laughs> Not necessarily. Uh, eight, eight, six. Hey! Woohoo! Woohoo! Oh, All right! All right. Ooh, and Tom chooses the other one. Do you want the white large or the black extra large? Oh. Are you sleeping in it or wearing it? You know? Eight, nine, three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw that. <laughs> what was that? 80, what was that? 83? <laughs> who, who was the last one? 893? Okay, there's black, extra large, or there's white large, and you can choose. Large. Okay. All right. So, we are going to switch out the camera. Yeah, go ahead. If you'd like to come with me and 10 or 11 or 12 other people, we're going to go to Southern Utah next month uh, for the price of $725 double occupancy. You can come down. We're following in the footsteps of Maynard Dixon. So we will be in the Canab area painting the Red Rock. There's some flyers at the back table there. There's uh, still a few, a few spots left, October 18th through the 22nd. I got my first taste of critique when I took my first year of college at Utah State University under um, a very stern man named Adrian Van Suchland. Anybody know the name? It was a live figure drawing class. He was not not there the first day. The model came out. I had never seen a nude before. As soon as I got over that, I feel like I drew an exceptional piece of artwork. I feel that way because everybody in the class thought mine was the best. And then Adrian came back. His critique uh, was wordless. It included tearing the paper in half. So I thought I'd change a little bit tonight instead of being so nice. In case anybody wants to come and collect their painting before I get to it. No, the truth is, I had a lot of professors in my steps up through my master's degree, and many, all of them, I should say, said this would be a better painting if the composition was better, but they could never tell me how. And I was determined with my little type A personality to figure out what made a good composition. And I turned into somewhat of a freak about composition. And so I'm just going to... Normally we would have a longer 
discussion, but we're going to spend about two minutes each on these paintings. And we won't take feedback from you because we're behind and we want to give some time to Tom. So, can this mic go over there? Um, I think we actually have whoop, a portable uh, remote. Yeah, there's a remote. Yeah, so we can just have to do that. Um, I can just turn around. I can stay at the mic. At the mic, you can just turn around. Uh, if you want, I can switch the hands for you. Yeah, let's just do that. No, we won't have to worry about that. Switch the turn around. Yes. That is this on the top, but it's not. Well, that is. Okay. All right. We at least want to know who did this. So raise your hand. You have 15 seconds to tell us about the subject. Um, it's a convent in Croatia, and it was a painting that um, I did in probably an hour and a half. Um, I, I was practicing trying to do my paintings faster so that I didn't work, overwork them. Um, and, and essentially, it felt like it was inspired by the light and the atmosphere, I guess, Holiness and, and just joy in this place. It was just so beautiful and sparkling. And that was what I was trying to imagine. What, what truly uh, an exceptional painting. This is one of the freshest paintings. I told her this earlier that I've seen in a long time. Look how neatly she sandwiched that, the red colors in between the two blues. <laughs> the complementary color scheme there is really exquisite. And uh, and the freshness, again, is just wonderful. I would I'll try to say something nice and mean it, and then I'm going to be critical. <laughs> um, if, if you, if in case you can't see it, the widest part of the buildings and structures are on the left, and then it tapers to the right. This can make the eye leave the paper prematurely. And so something uh, making the tree taller on the right-hand side would probably be a good option the next time you paint that. Just a thought for you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, we have a grouping of buildings in the middle that are in a really good spot space-wise, but which one of those is more important or are they all important? Oswald Allred told us that we have to have one area to focus on, and I'm not really sure it's as powerful as it could be. It's just a thought. All right, we're ready for the next one. Anybody else have a comment? We kind of have to hurry. So. Sorry, you got like 20 minutes. All right. Who did this one? Well, this one. Turned around the other way. Oh, yeah, there you go. Zoom it in a little bit. Okay. Give us a commentary. Tell us about the subject. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, aspens have always been my thing, uh, living in Utah. And then uh, I just switched it around a little bit and put the maple, maple leaves in and tried to think about the composition a little bit. And, this also has uh, a really high contrast, really beautiful high contrast, uh, it's mostly with color and not value. You have your blues against your reds, which is a split complementary and fun to look at, really fun. You, uh, you've really given us a, a one leaf that's bigger than the rest of them to look at, and that's great. It might have been even a little tiny bit better if you'd have changed that focal point to maybe an orange or red or a more violet red, just so that it was completely different than the rest. I'm a real, I'm a real proponent of strong focal areas. I've done a lot of not necessarily scientific research that tells us that the eye can only focus on one thing at a time. And if there's two things in there that draw the same attention, you're going to confuse the viewer. 
Did you know that if you go if you go into a gallery, time yourself, how long do you stand in front of a painting before you move on? The average time is three seconds. You want people to stop. And what's going to make them stop is to let them focus on one thing at a time. One big thing and then a few other smaller things. So this is pretty good. You have a really strong cut through your paper just off center to the left that could probably be diminished a little bit and would soften up that background a little bit. But that's a pretty nice little painting. I would hang that in my house. Any other comments? Yep. Go ahead. None? Agree. <laughs> figures are really hard to do but the hardest thing about the figure is uh, overcoming your own mind because your mind looking at any figure will tell you that skin is flesh colored and the mistake that most of us make is coloring in the entire face with flesh color before you even stop to see that there might be a highlight someplace. Leaving a white spot on a flesh tone is difficult. You have to force yourself to do it. Who did this? Barbara did this. Tell us about it, Barbara. Oh, it's a, it's a colored value sketch. I want to do it big, so um, comments help. You've got some beautiful greens in there that are hard to see on the screen in the cheek while it was wet. Really pretty. In case you haven't noticed, you have, you have green in your skin. If you don't believe me, look at the veins on the back of your hand. It's showing through the melanin of your skin, which is olive-colored. And you have unoxygenated blood through there, and the veins are actually green. And so throwing some green into the facial structure... Alvin Gittins taught that out of the University of Utah, and probably not a better Utah portrait painter ever existed. If you get a chance to see an Alvin Gittins collection anytime, stop everything and go see it. That's very nice, Barbara. I wouldn't change anything. You, you could have moved the figure back a little bit so that the hair might have been cut off a little bit so he wasn't facing off the page, but that's neither here nor there. It's just something to think about. Go ahead, Jenny. Or flipped it. I love telling people what to do. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> this is a pretty terrific little painting. It says Summer on it. Who's the artist? Summer. <laughs> well, Summer could be a last name, too. So, Where is the Summer? What? Say it louder. Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. Wow, look at the color in that roof. Is there anybody that wasn't drawn to that the very first thing they saw? Mm -hmm. She has a dynamic focal point. Well, what might have made it better? Uh, scooting it into the center of the paper just slightly, and then, and then take, being aware that the surroundings needed to be a different texture and a different value. Can you see that the values are all similar? And you could have been stronger Summer had you left the building, say, white on the brighter side, even to the point of letting the edges of the building disappear into the sky. It's worth re-sketching and quickly and doing it again just to see what might happen were you to leave the lighted part of that building even brighter. Congratulations on your texture. Beautiful textures and fun, fun things to look at. A goat's eye, I would assume. Llama. Llamas. Uh, the building's beautiful and then your eye wants to find some place else and you've got those two lo lovely organic figures there to look at. Your sky is spectacular. I love your splashes. <coughs> really good, good painting. It needs to go on a dark mat. Next. Thank you. Barbara, I think this is yours too. Yep. Tell us about it. Again, it's a pre-sketch. Uh, it's from a trip I took in Maine with Lester. He's so fun. We were so in uh, a coma when we were there in um, the Maine trip. Um, this is a guy on a ship, and, and I know people are asking, what is it? 
So there's that. Uh, it's another pre-sketch I could use some comment on. Your pre-sketches are really, really nice. Um, the more I look at it, the more I can't see the figure. I'm going to be critical to start with. Okay. Um, I knew it. Barbara can take it, so... Jenny, just tear that one up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, for those of you who have never been taught the power of the pyramid, it's incredibly powerful. It's one of the strongest things you can add to your paintings. Primarily because uh, architects use it as one of the most stable foundations or buildings ever made. It's one of the reasons why the pyramids still stand. And the, st the strength that it has is because it has such a strong weight at the base and very light weight at the top, and so it's very powerful. Most part portrait artists understand this and will place a portrait in a triangular situation, either with objects here or there, to create that strong presence. And, and so my critique is, first of all, um, my goodness, you're a good painter, Barbara. I've told you this forever. Not many people paint as loosely as Barbara. She's on the verge of not being liked by society because she's so loose. Uh, what, I mean, what I mean by that is... I will clarify. Loses her tickets. She will be sought after by collectors who understand and appreciate loose watercolors. And the general public does not understand that, and you know what I'm talking about. So she's, collectors are after this kind of a thing. You could really cut through the pyramid, Barbara, and crop out part of that triangular rope and pulley, and your figure would then come alive. Let's do the next one. Uh, we discussed this uh, a little bit at the start, but let's go back. Is it just dunes? Oh, I'm sorry. You tell us, tell us about it. Well, it worked. It really did. The, the truck is, nobody looked at the background before they saw the truck, so congratulations. Uh, again, um, by, the, by the way, that front wheel and fender, that should be published somewhere. It is really good. It should go in a textbook for the looseness and the, you have a reflective light quality on that front fender that is unmatched. It is really good. And congratulations in keeping whites where they belong. You have crossed the line. You now understand where white belongs. And, and you're on your way. Thank, thank you for uh, losing the tire in, in the, the mush of the black or the brown down in there. Most people don't like to lose an edge because they want to show everything. Lose an edge, it's okay. We're looking at the truck, not the tire. It's really okay. L lose the edge. That's a really good painting. I crop it down a little bit. Consider putting it in a square frame, cropping out what's not used in the background at the top and the bottom, and I think you'll find that it will be great. We'll do the next one. Tell us about this. Go ahead. Um, I was just going through some old photos and came across this picture of my husband, and I liked the way the light hit his face, so I. We painted it. We painted it, yeah. Have you won awards in portraiture? No. Have you entered workshops and won awards for portraiture? No. Why not? <laughs> she could teach a class in portraiture. She understands wet and wet. She understands her technique techniques so well that she's not afraid to throw a little blue and a little green in there while it's nice and wet. This is a, very, a great example of a very loose painting. Just incredibly well done. You, you could maybe soften up the shirt and the wrinkles down here in the bottom just a little so that we're not so drawn to it because the face is what's important. And uh, my hat's off to you for leaving the white highlights in the hair. It's just a really great painting. Thank you. 
And is your husband like it? That's what's yes, more important. Yes, he likes okay. it. Okay, <laughs> that's the most important thing. <laughs> Uh, tell us about this. Whose is it? Go ahead. Uh, it is <coughs> from a photograph that friends took of her cat that she posted on Facebook after her cat died. And so I just thought the light was so pretty on that photograph that I wanted to do something softer and um, send it to her. So this was my sort of value sketch before I did something larger. When I was at BYU, I took a course in philosophy called aesthetics. We use the term aesthetic wrong. We often, we often use it wrongly. Aesthetics means philosophy, <laughs> art philosophy. I hope I can remember where I was going with this. <laughs> she taught us of an experience called an aesthetic experience that happens to you when you physically can't hold your breath in while you're looking at a painting. In other words, you're so taken by it, you lose your breath. That's what happened when I looked at this piece. It's, there's something about contrast that just, for lack of a better reason, term, just turns me on. I love high contrast paintings, and it might be the, the alpha architectural male that is in us, and women have a tendency to paint a little softer. I'm not trying to stylize anybody, but this is really a great painting. If this were my painting, I would take the strong edge of the, the what's happening on the dark, very dark on the right-hand side, and just break up that hard slice right there, just by scrubbing out something to stop that hard cut. And then you should put this in a frame, because despite its size, it's worthy of an award. It's a very good painting. Sometimes our sketches really turn out better, and after all, isn't watercolor a sketching device? There you go. Let's have the next one. That, that cat, by the way, is my pick for the night. I, if you ever want to trade that off, I, I would trade you for something. <laughs> Who did this one? Tell us about it. Uh, just something out of my mind. Just something peaceful. Out of your mind. <laughs> I'm impressed. Uh, for the most part, the perspective is really pretty good, and your watercolor technique shows that you've had many years of experience. Uh, it's very pleasant to look at. It's a place where I want to go, too. Uh, I'd like to um, be particularly... Um, Well, the atmospheric perspective is very difficult to do. You just did such a good job on that little mountain back there. And take that mountain out in, the, in your mind's eye, and it will make all the difference in the painting. It really is great aerial perspective. That atmosphere is really there. On the other hand, making two of anything is almost impossible. Uh, Edgar Payne was big on the three spot. He taught, if you've ever, never read Edgar Payne's book, put it on your list. It's a must read. And it's been republished about, about eight or nine years ago, it was republished. So it's called uh, Landscape Composition by Edgar Payne, P A Y N E. Fantastic. Just a fantastic book. But he talks about the three spot, and he also addresses the idea of de designing in twos and how difficult it is. Three happens to be a magic number for a lot of artists. I don't know if it is for you, but it is for me. And if this were my painting, I would add a third element that was architectural in the background someplace. A little outbuilding, uh, a corral, um, a rusty old car, something to just give us a third place to go, or leave out one of the buildings. Take out the building on the left in your mind's eye, and what do you have? You have a beautiful red barn, stands by itself in its simplicity. And one is also a very good design element. So, Any comments on this? Next one. How are we doing on time, Jenny? Yeah. Uh, five minutes? Five-ish. We'll push it. OK, tell us who did this. OK, tell us about it. Well, it's from a photograph of my husband that I took when he didn't know I was taking his photo. The, he 
Um, I actually quite quite like it. It's really bold of you to throw uh, violet or almost violet in there. One of the more difficult colors to handle in all eternity. We're going to find out about it ne in the next life just how difficult it really was. <laughs> Most artists uh, shy away from it. Congratulations for doing it. And you notice what else she did in the eye section? It's yellows and greens. And so was that natural? If it was, then it's a, she's a natural artist because that's a complementary color scheme, and you're to be commended for that. Uh, I think, I think it would do do you well to not paint on that anymore. That board, who am I looking at? Yeah. Um, it lifts nicely, but for the sake of watercolor and just finding out what watercolor really is, and in my opinion. Uh, unlike uh, Joseph Allman, who likes to lift watercolors, the old school in me says, put the watercolor there and let it be. Even if it's wrong, let it just be. That's the old school in me. Lifting is, for some people, um, and that's great and I respect that, but it's not for me. So um, I highly suggest that you, you, that you try watercolor pencils or even prism color pencils because you have a need for, uh, for control in what you're doing, and I'll bet you anything, your prism color pencils would be exquisite. Give, give it a thought, give it a shot. Um, and by all means, continue to lift if you want to. Your best, um, your best teacher for that is Joseph Allman. And if you could find a, a disc of his workshop or go online and watch him paint, you would learn a great deal. So, any other comments? Okay, we'll move on. <coughs> Phil, I know this is yours. Tell us where this is and when you painted it. Uh, I painted it uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was at Tony Grove Lake. The lights off to the left, off the picture. And I was uh, impressed with this rocky hillside. Those pine trees behind your yellow uh, stand of trees is really good. Uh, there's, there's a little Winslow Homer in there, and you know it as well as I do. That sky just um, is, is textbook. It really is good. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this problem before, because I've seen your work, but you, you have a little too much going on in the painting. Do you want us to look at the rock? Do you want us to look at the tree? Or do you want us to look at all the rocks or the three trees? You really could crop that into two or three really nice paintings. And I've done that too. I've cut my paintings up. But that rock on the left is really great. And that background can't be beat. Those trees back there and the way you've worked in the wets are really great. Try to avoid putting three, three objects in there if they're all going to be like triplets. And, and I know that we all try not to, but there's kind of three little soldiers standing there in the middle. So you might consider just taking one of those away. Or two. Any other comments? This feels just such a great watercolorist. Any comments? I love the rock in the front. And it looks, almost looks like water, but it seems to be in the front. Yeah, that's one of the paintings you could crop out of there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Really, right there. really pretty. <coughs> Let's move on. Okay. That's it? We've had, no, but we've had about 30 minutes, so I think we can do about two more, and then we need to okay, do more. switch. And then, so... We'll just tear the rest of them off. Have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can then uh, have people make it Surprise, Tom. Didn't know I was going to put this up. Uh, talk about an exciting painting. Just exciting. Part of the excitement comes if you've never used the formats, the three formats, the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal. What Tom's done here is thrown in some, some really subtle diagonals that take us right to the center of that bottom part of that painting. 
this is a fabulous painting, Tom. You really should be proud of it. And he has such a neat focal point for us, and it's placed right in the right place. Uh, you need to plant plan air more. Um, where, where is the, where'd you do this? Uh, this is at the uh, Jordan campus, the Sully Community College. It was after my class one evening, sitting in the parking lot. I thought, hey, I got to paint that. Some of our best paintings come when we sketch like that. The richness of your, your reds and oranges down there that tell us it's a foreground, and then the shadow over the mountain in the back is just really nice. It's just a terrible mat. <laughs> We won't tear up your painting, but let's tear up that mat. What color do you suggest? Something bright and light and large. Put that in a way oversized mat, and you just... So it'll sell immediately. Somebody will take that and put that in a six-inch mat. It would be beautiful. You going to do a workshop on this soon? Yeah. On matting? On matting. I'm... You could. <laughs> we could, I suppose. Next. So, um... How about we do one more? Do you mind stepping out in the hall to continue? No, that'd be great. We'll get a time to come. Is there doubt in anybody's mind what the artist wanted us to look at? No? no? <laughs> Sticks out like a sore thumb, in this case a sore rock. Really pretty. That atmospheric perspective in the background is really pretty. It could have been pushed a little bit more. Do you know what I mean by pushed? You could have lightened each section as it went back even more and the dynamics of that painting would have just been fabulous. Really, really neat. Um, even though you have a diagonal in the picture, it repeats the diagonal in the background, the foreground and the background. If this were my picture to finish, you need to subdue one or the other. Either the foreground or the background has got to be subdued a little teeny bit because much like what Phil had, we have two paintings there and they're competing for attention. So you can really um, subdue those red rocks in the background and they can still be as lovely as they are. Whose is this? It can still be as lovely as it is and not be quite so powerful because the foreground's really fun to look at and that's probably where I'd want to look. Where is this and when? how did you paint it? It's the Grand Canyon, and it's acrylic on paper. And you stood there and painted it? Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's two photographs put together because I just liked it that way. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I do that all the time. Thanks for having me. I, I, I really don't concern myself anybody. So I could certainly couldn't pop up with the big guys. But... And sorry we had to cut off. There was so much more. There was more paintings than I expected, so that's awesome. Yeah, we'll have to do that again. We'll see if we can get Lester to come back again on another meeting.
comes in. I just heard that. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here in the interest of time, but uh, I'll talk on the microphone here for just a little bit, and then I'll break out here in the middle of the floor, and I'll be setting up stuff, and hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. But um, yeah, this is my little presentation for this evening, just talking about equipment and supplies for plein air painting to have a successful experience. I think of now uh, 18 people who will be teaching. We've got we've got the capacity, I think, for as many as 100 students. We're in the 50 student range, and the and the number is growing. But that's where we're at. So you're welcome to come and sign up and participate. The instruction part will be 13, 14, 15. The 16th will be when. A lot of works of art will be on display in the Midway Town Hall, so it'll be a great event. All right, you can come out of it now. Everybody awake? Okay. Uh, oh, that's going to read terrible. Oh boy. That's a lot of words. That is a lot. Okay, just going to have to explain it. Trust me, it looked really good. Can you tip? Can you tip it vertical? Let's see. Let's turn it vertical and see if it makes it bigger. Nope, it's not going to turn. My screen doesn't turn. You know what I mean? Okay, well, anyway, that was supposed to be the supply list for you to just maybe take notes from, but say la vie. As I have. Um, Trying to figure out how to set up and do plein air painting over the years. I've gone through as many iterations and possibilities, just more than you can shake a stick at. In fact, sometimes when I go into the shop, I don't tell my wife that I'm doing anymore because she just starts to chuckle. <laughs> so, but for plein air painting, I've come up with something that works for both my oil painting work as well as watercolor. I know I said the all work here at this meeting. <laughs> but uh, this tripod right here has been. It doesn't. Okay, yeah. Did it turn? Okay. All right, so. Um, this tripod has become the centerpiece of my uh, plein air work for, uh, for the most part. I've got other options, but there are certain things that I make for myself because I like making mousetraps. 
but this is something I just couldn't build well for myself, so I just got the best I could find. This is a Sienna brand, Plein Air Pro, uh, easel, Plein Air easel, and it's made for artists to work with in the field. Now, uh, there are Plein Air watercolor setups that the artists can buy. I make them. And while this is my oil painting palette, it's also my tabletop for my watercolor palette. And I can take something as large as my Stephen Quiller palette. I'm sorry. <clears throat> My Stephen Quiller palette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll never let me live that down, will you? <laughs> okay, so I'm able to set my palette like this, and I'm able to work off of it. As far as working uh, with a container that won't leak, I went for the baby bottle. <laughs> Works for me, so I'm able to set that there. Now, this is the tripod palette portion of my setup. So now it's time for the uh, the easel itself, which is this right here. Uh, I can do both oil paintings and watercolors on it. It's got a lot of oil paint stains. But when I'm working in watercolor, of course, I've, I've got a separate board that I can just put in here, use these cleats to clamp it into place, and it goes real well for me. So, this little foot came with the easel. I screwed it down to a piece of oak, glued the uh, piece of oak, and screwed it to these two plates of uh, maple plywood, and it will clip right in to this little unit here. There we go. I got this sweet top of the ends. And there we go. Set up and ready to go. Now, this is actually a little tall for me working watercolor, but typically I don't let out the bottom section of the legs, but for oil painting, it's at a good height. But uh, that is my that is one iteration out of a billion, maybe a million, that I've come up with. I've built planar boxes that have a pallet that open up to a little easel sitting right there. That uh, it's kind of like the old uh, the uh, gorilla boxes that, that, that are made. So. There's that unit right there. What else have I got? I have got this chair. It flips out real easily. It's old. The fabric is wrinkly. I wish it would break, but it won't. <laughs> I want to get a new one, but it does real well. It's a solid unit so far. And actually, question. what's that? Do you usually sit down and paint watercolors, or do you have that as so what do you get? It's a good question. The answer is all of the above. Depends on the situation. Got this little aluminum table at Sprawl Mart, Walmart. And uh, uh, of course, Linda, you use a plastic one. No, I have two of those now. Two of those now, yeah. yeah. I got the idea from you. And I saw this in Walmart and said, yes, I need it. <laughs> so, it works pretty well. I'd like to think that I'm the one who invented the use of this tackle box for something other than fishing tackle. It was many years ago when I got this at a local sporting goods store. And there's a little, there's a little, uh, uh, boxes within it that will hold tubes of paint and brushes. I can put this. It's actually well. It's got this particular palette in it, okay. But I can set up in this manner 
and I can work from there. I can hold water containers inside here. It's not a bad way to go. Okay. Now, typically, when I'm, I forgot to mention when I'm painting uh, with this set up here, I've got this unit, which, of course, I made because I like to make stuff. But it will hold uh, just it'll, it'll hold everything here right in here, and I can carry it and walk around with it. Does really well for me. It'll hold paint. It'll hold panels. It'll hold paper takedown panels. And I can actually take about three or four uh, sheets of paper ready to paint on in this. And I can paint in one location so I can just turn 360 if I wanted to. Okay, um, another, well, the last option that I wanted to tell you about is this little unit right here that I got at, uh, I think it was Michael's. And this is totally self-contained. I can paint on sheets as small as as, as, as small as one eighth size sheets. So that's what seven and a half by five and a half. Okay. So twenty-two by thirty, one eighth of that. That'll fit on the panels that I have in here. I've got tape. I've got board. I've got paper. I've got brushes. I've even got a couple of palettes. And I've got. A baby bottle. <laughs> okay. So I've got everything I need right here. Pencils included. So this is my most portable unit that I have. And I will take it uh, in a backpack and uh, go up into the mountains with it sometimes and paint on a little hike. So that's what I have to do. I, those are the various options that I have set up. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if it was starting to get windy, would you ever, ever have to clamp down your pallet? To yeah, the I would. But also, <coughs> sometimes I want to pull out this pallet. I will use this one here. This is my little workbook. There we are. And it's, it's good to work with. Okay. Sometimes I'll just literally stand here and paint in this one. So, um, many options to, to think about and work with. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, okay, you had your little homemade toolbox there to pack it all in. Uh, but if you're not using that, do you use your cart? And after, this is my problem, like you can pack it all in really easy because it's dry. Right. Yeah. But then I can't close up my Stephen Quiller palette and tip it back into my toolbox That's there. That's true. That's true. So That's why I actually the, use this one so much and quite often keep this in the studio. Even though this is supposed to be a travel palette, the when logistics. Wet, tip it on its side, it doesn't work as well. So when you have that and your chair and your table and your toolbox, how do you pack it all? I pack it either within this little case, or within that case, or within my handy dandy Walmart special shopping cart. Yeah. And I've been known to walk along the streets of Salt Lake City. <laughs> and yell random things and really enjoy my, my role there. What's that? Go paint for food. There you go. There you go. This little setup here, I probably use the least, but sometimes when I just want to get cozy. So, a variety of options. Now, um, so this talks about many of the things that, uh, as a matter of fact, it might, if you don't mind, maybe we could email this out. Okay, good. And, but there are, uh, there are many things that you need, your, your watercolor setup, 
what is that going to be? I've given you a few ideas. I promise mine are just a few of me. So, palette. Uh, what palette do you like to use? Paints? What, kind, what colors do you like to use? I don't know. You tell me. You figure it out. I figured it out for myself. I'm not going to test it. I can take your bonus. How's that? But uh, uh, brushes, water containers, board and tape. Uh, can I just ship this? I'm going to just move it. Uh, I'll just... Okay. Ooh, ooh, oh. All right. Now, okay, so proper clothing. Right now, the way I'm actually dressed this way, because this is the way I go plein air during warm weather months. The problem is when I show up at my dentist's office, he thinks I'm going golf. <laughs> but these really are work clothes for me. They really are. I have a hat that is a loose weave, and it's actually about a quarter size smaller than what typically fits me comfortably. Consequently, other people have lost their hats, and I have hung on to mine. <laughs> and that's the reason why I did that. So. Starting to get worn out, starting to get broken, so maybe get a new one soon. Appropriate clothing. Sometimes uh, when I'm going up into the hills or out in the desert, I'll put on something different than shorts. But I try to be comfortable and try to dress for the occasion. Yes, I've painted with watercolor in the dead of winter. I've, I've painted with oil paint. As a, in temperatures as low as minus 15. And uh, boy, does the paint go weird then. It's really strange. Uh, bug net might be a good idea. Drinking water, don't confuse it with your <laughs> other water. Uh, appropriate food and snacks, bug repellent, even appropriate medication that you might need. Always have a first aid kit with you. Always let someone know where you're going and when you expect to return. I go out and plein air paint alone a lot. And there's only been a couple of places where I felt like I shouldn't be there. And it was sad because one of them is my favorite little canyon. But uh, don't do more than you know that you're capable of, especially if you're going out alone box or cart or something to carry it all in and convey it to the place where you wish to work. Think mobility as much as you can. Okay? So, I've, as I've shown you these ideas here, uh, the purpose is to help kind of inspire some thought uh, as to what you might do to get yourself in a better position to be a planner. Plein air work is hard, but so rewarding and fun when you do it and it comes together and just feels good. And uh, I just need to learn how to map my paintings better, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta work on that problem. <laughs> Thanks, Lester. <laughs> okay, can we zoom this out a little bit now? Sure. So I have some images to show you, kind of finish up this evening's presentation. Oh. <laughs> My grandson, Max. Oh, I hit you that. One thing you can't do is sit still when you change his diaper. I watch him three days a week. Love the little toad. Uh, this is a game sheet of some of the paintings that I've done, watercolor paintings I've done throughout the summer. And uh, some are demonstrations for classes, some were from live 
Most were from live, some were from photographs. One of them was totally bad. And, uh, I ain't telling you which one. Okay. Some more. A couple of memory pieces in this, uh, in this, uh, the last two, the waterfall and that kind of mountainous desert landscape are uh, actually memory pieces. And, you know, in many respects, these uh, reflect all the little places I've gone to this summer with my family. You know, vacationing here, having fun with at a family reunion there. You know, they show up and they say, okay, where are we going to put Dad? We'll set him here. Okay, we're going to go play Dad. And they'll come back a couple hours later and pick me up. I'm paying and I'm happy. Whoops. The only way to do plein air is to do plein air. Just dive in and do it. Just plan on knowing that you may not knock out a great piece. It's going to take you a while to get through the good stuff. you got to get through the bad stuff before you get through the good stuff. So paint, 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 paint. Okay? And uh, for every painting I showed you here, there's at least one, sometimes two at home that didn't make it great. They just didn't make it. So. You, you just have to keep at it and keep at it. And plein air painting helps you to be a better artist overall. Even in the studio, it helps you to be a better painter. So get out there and be ready to mess up the coat and make a sheet of paper. Thanks for listening.